Tomorrow is the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, and it marks the end of the ecumenical season of creation. So we spent the last four Sundays listening to creation, to the forest, the mountains, the oceans, the rivers, and the soil. And today we reflect on a medieval saint who speaks powerfully to our times. Personally, I had a very good friend who was a Franciscan brother, and through him sensed something of the depth of Franciscan spirituality and learned to appreciate it very much. I also visited Assisi not so long ago. And I think I've said, I've told you this before, I sat close to Francis's tomb and sensed an amazing presence. And I don't think that I had previously understood the communion of saints. So today's liturgy will draw on Franciscan prayers and the words of St. Francis. And so I greet you with the words Francis used whenever he met someone. Good people, the Lord give you peace. We have a prayer which we say the words in bold together. We adore you, most holy Lord Jesus Christ, here and in all your churches throughout the world. And we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful people, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you, are, you ever delight to reveal yourself to the childlike and lowly of heart. Grant that following the example of the blessed Francis, we may count the wisdom of the world as foolishness, and know only Jesus Christ and him crucified, who is alive and remains with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. But we begin not with words of Francis, but from our own tradition, words of John Milton. Let us with a gladsome mind praise the Lord, for he is kind. You're very welcome to change he to she if you wish. <laughs> Thank you. 
St. Francis said, Weep, hills, weep, mountains, rocks, rend yourselves, valleys heave deep sighs, because love is not love. we do not completely forgive make us Lord forgive completely that we may truly love our enemies because of you and may we fervently intercede for them before you returning no one evil for evil and may we strive to help everyone in you darkness of our hearts and give us true faith, certain hope, and perfect charity, sense and knowledge, Lord, that we may carry out your holy and true command. Our first reading from Lamentations chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She that was great among the nations. She that was a princess amongst the provinces has become a vassal. 
She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate. Her priests groan. Her young girls grieve. And her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters her enemies prosper, because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From daughter, Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Amen. We're going to sing Francis' prayer, make me a channel of your peace. The bits in italic should come after the second verse, not the first verse. Make me a channel of your peace. Just to be a Christian. I also find it quite challenging <laughs> as well. So when we've just sung that song, um, make me a channel of your peace. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to be really brave. And I think that comes from God. So, yeah. Okay, this reading is from Luke, and it's chapter 17, verses 5 to 10. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. 
The Lord re replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from ploughing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you may eat and drink. Do you think, do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Amen. It's quite noticeable that many of the things we buy in supermarkets these days are much smaller than they used to be. I'm old enough to remember when Mars bars were as big as sliced loaves. It's called shrinkflation. Rather than put the price up, they just put a smaller amount in the packet. It's actually quite annoying and you do feel cheated somehow. Jesus' disciples appear to have had a dose of shrinkflation. They want more faith. They want more faith. They just don't have enough and they could do with a dollar more. Jesus seems a bit harsh on his followers when he says, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry bush, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. A mustard seed is very tiny. So Jesus seems to be implying that the faith of these disciples is less than a tiny little seed. And remember he's saying this to people who've given up their livelihoods, left family behind, and are following a dissident character at considerable risk to themselves. And yet their faith is apparently minuscule. Mulberry trees do not have a habit of uprooting themselves, let alone replanting themselves in the sea. So if the disciples were to acquire the tiniest amount of faith, seemingly they would be able to do the most amazing things. But they just don't have it. And maybe they're just asking for the wrong things. Jesus tells a parable, I guess, in Bible times, they did not have to deal with the working time directive because a slave comes in from the field after a hard day's work in the field. He should expect to carry on working. He should expect to carry on working by going to the kitchen to prepare the master's meal. And the slave is not going to sit down and be served a three course meal with all the trimmings by the master. He has to do his duty as the duty of a slave and prepare the dinner. Once at a funeral I learned that the deceased, someone quite close to me, unbeknown to most of us there, had turned down several honours in their lives. Turned down an OBE, turned down one or two honorary doctorates and to join the Gorseth, which is the Welsh honour system. His reason was that, as a minister, he'd just been doing his job, and that was all. He was just doing his duty, nothing special, although actually it was. And I think this is what Jesus is saying. We're not called to be miracle workers or hold prestigious positions. We're called just to be faithful, to do our job. Tomorrow, as I said, is the feast of St. Francis of Assisi. His feast, day, his feast day marks the end of the season of creation, now designated as an important part of the ecumenical calendar. 
there are many legends of St. Francis. And one is the story of how he acted as a mediator between a ravaging wolf and the terrified villages of Grubio, Gubbio in Italy. Or the legend of how Francis, and this one is perhaps more likely to be true, one day preached to a flock of birds and the birds listened attentively and at the end of the sermon Francis gave them a blessing and they flew off into the distance chirping happily and merrily. It was when he was almost blind and extremely ill that Francis wrote the canticle that we will sing at the end of our service this morning, a hymn which celebrates the whole of creation. It is rich in its understanding of the interconnectedness of creation. And through poetry, it gives us a theological way of looking at life, so vital for our contemporary predicament. But Francis was a fiery character. He came from a merchant family. He was a musician, flamboyant, a snazzy des dresser, and a bit of a carouser. Yet he had an instinctive and burning compassion for the poor. As a young man, he set out to serve in the army of the Pope. He had a dream in which a voice asked him, Francis, which, whom is it better to serve, a lord or his vassal? And Francis replied, surely it is better to serve the Lord. And he did. Francis wandered around the countryside, devoting time to prayer, seeking out chapels in need of repair, and struggling to know what his own mission was. And so he went to Rome to pray near the tomb of the apostles. And when he was at St. Peter's, he saw a beggar standing there. Francis, always impetuous, exchanged his fine clothes for the clothes of the beggar and changed places with him, learning what it was like to beg for a living. Francis, like Jesus, turned the values of the world on their head. And when he returned to Assisi, he rejoined his old friends and went back to his youthful revelries. But he was different. His friends assumed he was in love and teased him to know who she was. His intensive, impulsive reply was, she is more noble and more beautiful and rich than any you have set eyes on. And yet he himself did not know who she was. The answer came when he was riding out of Assisi and his horse swerved before a man with leprosy who was begging impulsively Francis was always impulsive. He dismounted, gave the beggar all his cash, and lifted the finger of the beggars to his lips, and the lep leper returned the kiss of peace. There and then she knew who she was. He called her Lady Poverty, and he committed his whole way of life to her. He began preaching wherever he could. He had an engaging and charismatic preaching style. And his journey towards forming the Order of Friars was an ever-deepening awareness of the gospel. Two aristocratic men asked to join him, and he was not sure how to respond. So he took them to the church and left the two men praying. And then he went to the altar and opened the gospel and his eye fell on the verse, if you were perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then he opened it again at random and read, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Again, he turned a page and read, and he commanded them that they should take nothing for the way and then he turned to his two praying companions and said, Brothers, this is our life and our rule. 
And isn't that why we uphold St. Francis still today? He got it. He got the gospel. He was intense, deeply moved by the story of the life of Jesus, personally immersed in the suffering of Christ. Yet he was totally humble in his obedience. Let me tell you why Franciscan monks and nuns wear the clothes they do. When Francis was, Francis's father was away, Francis, out of his passion for the church, sold much of the stock from the family business and spent it restoring church buildings. And when his father came back, clearly the business was in a lot of trouble. And so was Francis. So much so that the father took him to court. Francis was rattled and proclaimed now that his only father was our father in heaven. And he vowed to give back everything he had taken from his father, including the clothes on his back. And there and then he stripped naked and gave his father even the clothes he was wearing. And he left the court wearing a tattered tunic and a hood that a worker had discarded, tied up with a piece of rope. And that is the Franciscan habit. I wish there were more time to tell you more about Francis. Let's just say that Francis was a man of deep faith. And in the light of the gospel reading, we might just want to say that he did his duty. His deep insight into the gospel was what in our own times we know as the preferential option for the poor the vocation of the church in our age god loves the poor and that is francis's abiding contribution to the church not for nothing did the latin american pope name himself francis that is the conviction of the church in our age. It is this total identification with the poor which connects Francis with Jesus. And it is Francis's love of creation, perhaps seeing the vulnerability of nature, which connects him to our time. God loves the poverty within ourselves. God loves our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses our doubts, our struggles. And God loves all who struggle with material poverty and all who seek to defend and protect them. And what if we today were to open randomly the pages of the gospel this morning and read the words of Jesus? Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Francis and Jesus bring us neatly to the end of the season of creation. The gospel message, as Francis discovered, stands the values of the world on their head. This is a spiritual way of looking at our relationships, our personal choices, our politics, our faith. Our spirituality is not an accumulation of faith points. Faith neither shrinks nor inflates. Faith is a gift, an inheritance, but it is not an inheritance of wealth. Just as Francis stripped himself and took on the discarded garments of the poorest, we need to strip away our attachments to possessions and accept the inheritance of love, duty, and service which Jesus bequeaths. Lady poverty is more noble, beautiful, and rich than any you have set eyes on. Let us serve her in whatever way we can, with our talents, our knowledge, our resources, our prayers, our lives. For in so doing, we serve the Master. And is there an ambiguity in the way Jesus tells the parable? Perhaps we are to understand that in the gospel reverses of values, the servants who come in from the fields are invited to sit with the Master, to share in the bread and wine set out for them on the table of grace. And so we are invited in our need, in our poverty, to make common cause with the downtrodden of humanity and the neglected of the earth. This is our inheritance. Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Amen.
Church in the world, our Father most holy, our Creator, Redeemer, Consoler, and Savior. We come to you deeply concerned for the people of our country. We think of all who are anxious for the future, those who are insecure in their homes, whose income is no longer adequate for their needs. Pray for all caught up in the tense conflicts in Ukraine. For those leaving Russia to avoid conscription in an unjust war. For all who are working to ensure security and energy supplies. And we pray that we do not overlook the other conflicts in the world. Especially we continue to pray for the peoples of the Horn of Africa. <coughs> we pray for the health of the planet. 
the peoples of the world will value your creation, love it, preserve all that is good within it, remembering all impacted by our changing climate. We pray <coughs> for our church community, for any undergoing ill health, for those we know and love, and for all who join us online. May the power of your love, Lord Christ, fiery and sweet as honey, so absorb our hearts as to withdraw them from all that is under heaven. Grant that we may be ready to die for love of your love as you died for love of our love. Amen. We sing again, <clears throat> the love of God comes close where stands an open door.
COVID time, so I guess we still can't share the peace, but we can probably wave to each other. St. Francis had those words, good people, the Lord give you peace. So you're welcome to either mouth or shout it across the room to the church to, to greet each other with a sign of peace. Peace. The good people, the Lord give you peace. The people of the Lord give you peace. <laughs> peace to you. Peace to you. There you go. Thank you, Claudina. We can always rely on you. <laughs> you say the words in bold in the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord is here. God's Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to offer thanks and praise. Honor and worship are indeed your due, our Lord and our God, through Jesus Christ. For you created all things, by your will they were created, and for your glory they have their being. Above all, we give you thanks and praise for your grace in sending Jesus Christ when we had turned away from you. And therefore, with people of every nation, tribe, and language, with the whole church on earth and in heaven, joyfully we give you thanks and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All oh, glory and honour to you, God of grace. For you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, once for all on the cross, to be the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world, that all who believe in him might have eternal life. The night before he died, he took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, to remember me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, in this sacrament of the suffering and death of your Son, we now celebrate the wonder of your grace. So we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come in glory. Redeemer God, rich in mercy, infinite in goodness, we were far off until you brought us near, and our hands are empty until you fill them. As we eat this bread and drink this wine, through the power of your Holy Spirit, feed us with your heavenly food, renew us in your service, unite us in Christ, as we offer you our songs of everlasting praise. Mm -hmm. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come, you that are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you.
eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you. And thank you, Francis. Thank you, Anthony, for composing music for this morning's service, which was really very special. And thank you to Yuki, Maria, and Maya. We've got lots coming up, actually. We've got Bible study on Tuesday at uh, 7 o'clock on Zoom. That's the last of our series on the Bible and land. And then on Wednesday at 7, we've got uh, a talk on uh, colonialism and climate change with the person whose name I've forgotten, but is the uh, research, no, is the uh, policy director at uh, at climate action now, I think it's called. But also we have music from Maxi Coca, music from the Andes, and a talk on uh, colonialism and climate change. Next Sunday is Homelessness Sunday, and Catherine will take the service, which is preparing with people from our own project, Margins. So hopefully there'll be some people from Margins here as well. And then uh, following Wednesday, we have a film called After the Flood, which is a film about the story of Christian connections with the slave trade. It's part of our Black History Month uh, 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 events. And then on the 26th of October, here, we have an evening of music and poetry, music of change and resistance uh, with Union Chapel Voices. So please come and support that. We sing a hymn. Francis's great cantor, all creatures of our God and King.
May God's love surround us, God's joy fill our lives, God's peace be in our hearts, and God's blessing be with us, this day and always. Amen. <laughs>